Okay, I guess we could get started. Um, so today's uh, today's paper is the Komodo paper, and I've just put a little bit of background for this on the slide. I think. Excuse me for one second. Oh, that should be okay. Um, we haven't, this is the first time we've started to talk about security. And so I'm gonna take some of the time to give some background information about security before plunging into the details of this paper. A couple of things to notice about it. We've seen these several of these authors before because they wrote the uh, Iron Fleet, some of them wrote the Iron Fleet paper and the Armada paper. So the general style of what's going on here should be, should be reasonably familiar by now. Um, what these guys have done is they've proposed a replacement for a fairly elaborate feature that Intel recently, well, recently five years ago, added to the x86 family. Um, and the motivation for their work is that the Intel feature is very complicated and uh, so there's some doubt about you know, what sort of bugs it might have. And also there's been a fair amount of demand for new features, which is very difficult for Intel to provide because of the fact that the thing they already have is so complex. And also that uh, because it's so much embedded in the hardware of the processor, it's very difficult to change it. So the basic uh, goal of this Komodo work was to provide the same capabilities that the Intel SGX feature does, but to do it without, um, to, with an absolute minimum amount of hardware support, pushing as many things as possible into software. So I wanna start just with some basics about security. Um, so security is all about the tension between the desire for isolation and the desire for sharing. Um, so if you just want isolation, it's relatively straightforward. The simplest way to get it is just, just have a, a machine that sits all by itself and doesn't talk to anybody else. But there are lots of other ways to get it that are relatively straightforward. And there are two aspects to isolation. One aspect of it is secrecy or as the security people insist on calling it confidentiality, which means that you control what data goes out of your system. And the other aspect of it is integrity, which is um, that you control what sort of actions can be taken. Uh, uh, two years, what, what sort of things can be done to your system from the outside. But isolation in its pure form is pretty straightforward. What makes things tricky is that a completely isolated machine is not that useful. And so in addition to isolation, you also want to have some amount of sharing. And that raises the question of how are you going to control the amount of sharing? Because again, if you're willing to share unconditionally with the rest of the world, it's pretty easy. But if you want to exercise control over who can do what to your system, then it becomes quite a bit more complex. So the who aspect of, of um, security is uh, usually called authentication. And its purpose is to answer the question, who gets data out of the system? Who can give commands to the system? And the formalization of the informal notion of who is um, the idea of principles. So a principle is some agent, more either a very concrete agent or a fairly abstract one. And the job of authentication is to figure out what agent is making a particular request. So if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the canonical security picture. It shows that you have um, requests coming into your system from the outside, from some outside agent. And then you have some resource which is being uh, protected uh, by the security of the system. And in between the requests and the resource sits uh, this red guy, the guard. And the job of the guard is to answer the question, who's making the request and what are they allowed to do? 
and then to decide whether to let the request through or to block it. And the guard is, um, takes input from the system security policy in order to make its decisions. Surrounding the whole system is this dashed blue box, which is, symbolizes the isolation of the system from the rest of the world. And the part of the idea is that the only path into or out of the system is going to be uh, along this arrow by which the request comes in and it has to be mediated by the guard. So that's the basic story of access control. And as I was saying before, consists of two aspects, the authorization, the authentication aspect, which answers the question, who's making this request? And the authorization aspect, which answers the question, uh, is that person, what is that person actually allowed to do with this resource? Uh, the, the third important aspect of security, which we won't be talking about today, is auditing. Uh, you, you keep a record of all the re requests that are coming in and what, what the responses were. So that, that when later you find out that something went wrong, you can figure out what it might have been. The other important aspect of this picture is that uh, um, this whole uh, isolation domain inside the blue box has to be hosted by something. There has to be some agent that is um, providing the resources that are necessary in order for this to actually run. This agent might be the, uh, uh, the hardware of a machine. It might be an operating system kernel. It might be a virtual machine monitor. It might be something like the common language runtime run of a, of a uh, programming language. There are many possible hosts, but in always, you always have this structure where you have the, some domain some execution environment that's being implemented by some host. So in order for this whole story to work, at runtime, you need to have secure channels uh, by which the resources, the requests can come into the system and responses, of course, can come out. There, this picture doesn't show the responses, but, but this is really a two-way arrow. In order to... So what you have to do to, you know, to set the policy is, is to give answers to the questions, who is being authenticated and what, yeah, what authorizations do they have to do things? And in order to manage security, uh, no, race ads. When you're actually running, um, the principles that you're dealing with have to be so-called secure channels, things that the, that the um, running system can actually directly traffic in. So in particular, uh, this black arrow along which the, well, why am I not seeing the, the cursor? That's confusing. This, this black arrow along which, whoops. I didn't ask for that. Uh, I've tried several different ways of being able to do more than just display the slides and all of them have their own problems. The arrow along which the requests come in has to be some concrete thing, a physical wire or a channel provided directly by the operating system host like a pipe or a cryptographic channel. One way or another, you, you need some concrete um, security mechanism. Let's just try something. Uh, small hiccup. Sometimes this helps. but not this time. Okay, too bad. Um, I'll just have to talk it through. Uh, the, the, security, the secure channel has to be concrete. On the other hand, in order to manage the security, it doesn't make any sense to say, I'm gonna allow, allow uh, 
some outsider to re read this file as long as it comes to, in on a channel that's encrypted by some particular encryption key, because you can't uh, define the policy in terms of encryption keys. That wouldn't, make, first of all, they change all the time. And secondly, they don't mean anything to you. So you wouldn't be able to manage the security based on encryption keys. In order to manage the security, you have to be able, be able to identify the principles in some way that's meaningful. And so there needs to be a connection between the, the way in which the security is managed using principle, principles who have names that are meaningful to you and the way in which the runtime is actually going to interpret the security, which is going to be based on the physical or logical concrete secure channels on which the requests are coming in. And the thing that connects these two things is the idea of a speaks for relationship. A principle A speaks for principle B. No, absolutely not. Um, and the idea of a speaks for relationship is that if principle A says something, you can assume that principle B said it too. So in the concrete example here, you have requests coming in, you know, in some concrete uh, cryptographic channel, that's A. So a request comes in on, ch on channel A, which we, we abstract by saying that principle A says the request. And then channel B is gonna be some logged in user, let's say like, like a Lampson. And we're gonna have a relationship which says that this cryptographic channel speaks for this user principle, Lampson. And the whole idea, the whole game of managing the connection between the physical or logical low level secure channels and the high level meaningful, meaningful principles is the main task of, of security management. And we'll see how this um, way of thinking about things shows up very directly in, in um, In the in the uh, SGX and its and its um, image. Okay, so let's think about the different ways in which the isolation can be achieved. Um, as I said, an execution environment always has to be hosted by something, and in general, one of these hosts is capable of creating multiple execution environments. A host could be a separate machine including a coprocessor, for example. It could be uh, one of these secure enclaves that we're gonna be talking about for the rest of this lecture. It could be a hypervisor, a virtual machine monitor. It could be an operating system. It could be a browser hosting, browser, hosting browsing sessions. Abstractly, we always have basically the same picture. There's some host with one or more execution environments being hosted by it. And the host is capable of establishing secure channels between the execution environments. For example, the pipes that an operating system can establish between two processes. So logically, a pipe for a pipe or some other channel connecting to execution environments just connect, you know, you know, just goes between environment one and environment two. Physically, of course, the information is passing through the host. So the, the pipe input implementation is actually done by the host. And an obvious question you have to answer if you're gonna have a structure like this is, um, if, if you receive a message from some execution environment, how do you know who's actually talking? How do you know what's actually in that execution environment? And the, the mechanism for answering that question is called attestation. And the idea of it is, uh, you have a channel that's established, for example, this black channel between E1 and E2, in the picture and somebody tells you that the principle on the far end of that channel is some extremely concrete piece of code. How do you make a piece of code concrete? The answer is you tell, you describe all of the bits that go to make it up. Of course, there are a lot of those bits in a typical execution environment. So, we, and we don't want to transmit uh, tens of millions of bits. But well, fortunately, cryptography gives us a mechanism for getting around that, which is to make a secure hash of the tens of millions of bits and treat that as the identification of what's in the execution environment. 
So somebody tells you that the guy on the other end of that channel has this particular hash for its code. And the, the jargon term for this is a measurement of the code. And then uh, some other, some part of security policy is, is going to establish a connection between this code hash and, and some meaningful identification for the code. For example, this is Linux version 2.1.3 or whatever. In this simple picture, the host is in a position to give you that information because the host set up the execution environment so it knows what the code hash is. So the host can tell you that the channel speaks for the, the code hash. And then policy is gonna say that the code hash speaks for some code name like Linux. And you can do this recursively as you can see in the picture at the bottom right corner. So you can have uh, principal host A attesting to, to B, which in turn attests to C. So in this picture, we've got the hardware at the bottom, uh, an intermediate monitor in the middle, and an enclave at the top. And this is the structure that we're gonna be studying uh, for the next hour. So in order to do this attestation, the host is gonna issue a statement that says, the monitor's key speaks for the monitor. And the monitor is gonna issue a statement that says, the enclave's key, KE, speaks for the enclave hash. And then policy is gonna say, the monitor is allowed to speak for any enclave hash. So the monitor can hand off that, that information, which means, what does that mean concretely? It means that when the monitor tells you that this particular channel speaks for the enclave, you're gonna believe it. And similar structure will work for, for um, in a way that we don't have time to go into today. For um, when, you, when, you have, when you move from one version to another, of the monitor or the enclave code. Okay, so that's the high level story about execution environments and att attestation. And in a little bit, we're gonna see how to make it more concrete. It's worth bearing in mind, just at a high level, what are the ways in which this story can be messed up? So if we have a host and an execution environment, X sitting on top of the host, how can the bad guy Y sitting on the outside mess it up? Well, there's basically three possibilities. One possibility is you send X some bad input, either directly or indirectly, which sends it off the deep end. And that's the, the you know, typical way in which um, things like buffer overflow bugs um, yeah. do their damage. You send in some input that causes the, the uh, X code to do something that its owner didn't plan on because of a bug. A second possibility is that the host provides some unsafe um, way of affecting the behavior of X. For example, a debugging interface and Y gets access to that even though presumably it shouldn't have done. And the third possibility is that you can, that, that Y may succeed in corrupting the host itself. So if you corrupt the operating system with a virtual machine monitor, you know, clearly you can corrupt any of the execution environments that sit on top of it. Okay, so how can we make, make this a little more concrete um, for, for the context of Komodo? Um, as we've seen, if a program is gonna act as a principle, it needs isolation. And there's many, you know, many different levels at which you can provide that. But if you want to work, work at a fairly low level, fairly close to the machine, the host could be an operating system. The host could be the hardware, of course, but we have a lot of reasons for not typically wanting to host directly on the physical hardware. So at the machine level, the host could be an operating system or it could be a hypervisor. And the, the main drawback of either one of these things as a as a secure host is that they're complicated and consequently they probably have bugs. The idea of enclaves is to replace certainly the operating system and even the hypervisor with something much smaller and simpler you know, that concentrates just on the security aspects of isolation and doesn't worry about all the other things that operating systems or hypervisors worry about like input output and resource allocation. 
So the idea of the enclave is it should be small. It should have a small trusted computing base. And, and because you, know, you want to be able to understand the security of the enclave by just thinking about the enclave mechanism, you have to take the view that any external OS or hypervisor or anything else that's sitting outside of the enclave and its implementation is the enemy. This, this is a very different way of thinking than what we normally think, which is that the OS is in charge, it's responsible for security and it's not the enemy. Here, the OS is not in charge, at least it's not in charge of the enclave part of the world. And, and you have to assume for the pro purposes of security that the OS is the enemy and is gonna do as much damage as it can, can to the security of the enclave mechanism. So the basic idea of the enclave is you're gonna have some sort of micro hypervisor. Yeah. It's gonna just concentrate on security. It's not gonna do any resource allocation. It's not gonna do any scheduling. It's not gonna do any IO. It's just gonna concentrate on security. It's gonna fight off the operating system and code that's running inside an enclave is gonna use cryptography for all of its external services. So it's gonna have some basic, basic me mechanism for shipping bits in and out. And it's going to make those bits secure by using cryptography, just as in the, in the large world, we use cryptography to secure network channels because we assume that we can't control the security of the, of the yeah, actual network mechanisms that ship the bits around from one place to another. And we depend on cryptography to make them make the, make the transmission of bits from one place to another secure in spite of the fact that the network might be hostile. Here in the world of enclaves, we're gonna depend on cryptography to make communication between one enclave and some, some other agent secure, even though the operating system might be the enemy. So what has motivated people to wanna to have enclaves? Well, one aspect of course is what I just said, you'd like to have more confidence in the security. And you'd like to achieve that by making things as simple, small and simple as possible. But there's, two, you know, there's, two, there's two, basically two styles of using enclaves. One style, which is the most conservative, says you're going to factor the application into less critical parts and more critical parts. And you're only going to try to secure the most critical parts. So, for example, if you want to do digital resource management, um, you're going to try to a package up into an enclave, just the parts of the DRM that are responsible for doing the crypto and leave everything having to do, do with running the display and, or, or playing the music or whatever it is on the outside, on the ground, that, that, that's not critical to the security that you care about. Similarly, if you wanna be able to sign things securely, you're gonna build a, a mechanism inside of an enclave that owns the, the cryptographic signing key, does the actual work of signing, um, but, but yeah. leaves all, yeah. all the complex user interface associated with figuring out what it is that should be signed on the outside. There are some subtleties associated with that, but that's the basic idea. You're gonna factor the application into a part that you really care about, yeah. that you consider to be critical, which you're gonna put in the enclave, which is gonna be relatively small and simple and then you're gonna leave everything else outside. It will be less secure, but, but hopefully less critical. Um, other examples, you'd like to be able to protect your cryptographic keys. So you'd like to tuck them away inside an enclave. And you may wanna you know, do various forms of more application dependent, confident, so-called confidential computing. For example, if you want to um, answer uh, queries against a database of, of um, information that has to be protected for reasons of, of, of um, secrecy or, or privacy, you, you might wanna put the database query system inside an enclave, uh, leaving the, the rest of the system outside. The other style of using an enclave, which, which is in principle also perfectly feasible, is to run your whole application in the enclave, just as if it were on a separate machine. And in this style of using it, you're, you're competing with existing, existing isolation mechanisms like the hypervisor or separate hardware. Uh, and the obvious advantage of the enclave has is, is the same one it had before, namely it's much simpler. But the downside is 
that an app um, use, uh, using the enclave in this style is much more demand, demanding for the enclave hosts because now you have to provide all the capabilities that, that the competition, the hypervisor or the separate hardware would have been able to provide. And you might not succeed in doing that. And as we'll see uh, in studying uh, SGX and Komodo, um, they, they, they fall somewhere in between here. You can't really successfully run a whole application. Uh, for example, a whole Linux a kernel uh, in an enclave, or at least you can't do it very well, but you can do, can run fairly large and complex things inside the enclave. Though we don't have a lot of experience with all of this yet, so it's not, um, I think it's way too soon to tell which of the uses of enclaves will be the most successful. So the threat model for this style of security is to assume that all the software outside the enclave is hostile. So in particular, the operating system is hostile other enclaves that might be running are certainly hostile. Um, and you have to think about all the different ways in which the OS or some other enclave might be able, be able to either um, figure out what your secrets are or, or interfere with your operation. Uh, for example, any resources, either logical or physical that are being shared are potential sources of, of uh, are potential threats. So sharing the cache, for example, between the enclave and the operating system is dangerous. Um, there have been, there was quite recently some interesting work that showed that Intel has thoughtfully provided a fairly fine-grained power metering uh, mechanism in the set, inside recent x86 chips, which allow you to figure out um, in a fair amount of detail how much power you your code is using. And it turns out that you can use this um, to figure, to, to um, leak cryptographic keys. Somebody sitting outside of the enclave in which the cryptography is being done can use the power metering um, on, at least in a, in a controlled setting can use the power meeting, metering to figure out um, yeah. enough bits of your key to significantly compromise its security. The other thing you have to worry about from the point, we're still talking about software attacks here, is so-called induced faults. Induced faults weren't really an issue in the good old days when, when um, machines were simple and they, they had very substantial physical margins. But over the last 10 or 20 years, there's been tremendous pressure to reduce the, the voltage margins and the, the uh, number of bits that are, number of electrons that are used to represent a bit in a, in a DRAM and so on and so forth. And the res result of the, this is, is that these, these, these things are now um, fairly fragile. And if you can mess this with their environment in some way, you may very well be able to induce a fault. So for example, um, an exploit from a few months ago is called, with the sexy name of Plunder Vault. Uh, they discovered that you can take the facilities that Intel provides for adjusting the operating frequency and operating voltage of, of various parts of a processor um, to make the pro processor, processor occasionally misbehave. In particular, I think it, they, they found that the multiply circuit was especially uh, vulnerable to this. So if you adjusted the operating voltage just right, you could make it, make it so that occasionally a multiplication would give the wrong answer. And it turns out you can use that to uh, leak keys of, you know, you know, from an RSA signature or, or uh, encryption. Uh, another thing along those lines, which is a few years old now, is um, people found that uh, if you, you can attack a physical DRAM chip if you hammer on the rows that are physically adjacent to some vulnerable row of the DRAM chip. You may be able to flip bits in that in that DRAM cell, and these are all things that can be done just by running software on, on the on the machine. In addition to that, that there might be uh, physical threats if you have physical access to the machine. 
So, and those fall typically into two categories, uh, act, passive and active. Passive threats are you might be able to physically snoop on the, on the buses that connect the chips. You may be able to sense the amount of power that the chip is using, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the chip, acoustic radiation from the chip, all kinds of things like that. And there are active physical threats that's more or less along the same lines as the induced faults that I was describing before. If you don't have software control of the frequency or voltage of the of the of the up CPU, you you certainly have external control of the frequency and voltage by um, messing with the with the clock or messing with the uh, actual power supply. You can control the temperature of the chip. You can shine light on it. And if the light is bright enough and have a sufficiently high frequency, uh, it may be able to induce faults inside the chip. You can spray it with alpha particles. Lots of exciting possibilities for um, for inducing faults from which you may be able to deduce things. So that's the story about the threat model. Uh, in, in the context of, of today's lecture, we're just gonna concentrate on software threats. And in particular, we're gonna concentrate on, on um, we're not gonna do, we're not gonna study this, this class of threats particularly, but it's good to know that the, the, these things exist. And depending on how worried you are about, about various different things that might go wrong, you need, you need to think about all these things and either decide that you don't care or do something about it. Okay, so, so much for background. The context for the, the work on Komodo is, a, is, the, is the, a feature that Intel built into x86 is starting about six years ago, which they call software guard extension or SGX for short. And this is implemented by two pieces of mechanism, both of them inside the CPU chip. First of all, there's hardware, which provides memory protection, exception handling, uh, a root key for, for um, doing attestation and randomness. Uh, all of them, all of these things provide, provided by more or less special purpose hardware inside the chip. And in addition to that, there's a lot of microcode also inside the chip, uh, which is responsible for creating enclaves mediating entry and exit transfers between the enclaves and the, and the normal world and attestation. So the, the, the overall story of SGX is it provides a fairly complete enclave mechanism. In order to make use of it, you, yeah. you need to have some amount of OS support, but the, the SGX the feature itself, itself is completely responsible for the security of the whole of the whole enclave mechanism. So that's Intel story. Um, possible attacks on the Intel mechanism are the ones we've discussed before involving side channels. Uh, possible bugs, the microcode is complicated and the interfaces to the microcode are pretty complicated. And it, it, it would be quite surprising if there aren't bugs in there somewhere. And the third class of attacks on SGX is the so-called controlled channels which arise from the fact that, that in some ways the OS can see a fair amount about what's going on inside the enclave. In particular, it can see all the page faults that the enclave generates in, a, in, 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 in considerable detail. And that's actually a fairly high bandwidth channel. A striking feature of, of uh, SGX, uh, which is supported directly by the hardware, is that when, when, when um, the, the chip wants to store, store data into secure memory outside of the outside of the chip, outside of the CPU chip. The data is encrypted, and it's also um, mapped in a, in a fairly complex structure called a Merkle tree, so that um, agents outside of the enclave can, uh, cannot read the data, and they can't mess with it without the enclave hardware noticing that the next time the data is fetched. On the other hand, so the, the memory data is secured fairly uh, carefully by the SGX mechanism. The addresses, not so much. You can 
the, the external world. You know, the addresses show up on the bus that connects the chip to the memory system. And so in principle, if you have physical access, the addresses are, are visible for snooping purposes. So that's the, the, the basic security story for SGX. The idea of Komodo, whoops, that's not where we want it to be. The idea of Komodo is to yeah, have an ab absolute minimal amount of hardware support for the basic enclave mechanism and to replace the rest of the, the, the basically to replace all the inside the CPU chip microcode that SGX has with a piece of software that they call a monitor. So you can think of this as disentangling the essential hardware capabilities from the software which can, which yeah. can, can uh, implement, yeah. implement all the rest of the features that you want on top of the hardware. Uh, I like to think of the monitor as basically being a baby hypervisor. It's much simpler than a hypervisor because it does not do any resource multiplexing. It does not do any IO. Its job is to handle transfers of control between, yeah. between the yeah. world inside the enclave and the outside world and to check that the right thing is happening and also to mediate the, the uh, attestation mechanism. It does, as we, we've been talking about for enclaves in general, it doesn't do any resource allocation. Its job is only to, to check that when the OS does resource allocation, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't do any, anything that's dangerous from the point of view of security. Of course, uh, all these uh, enclave schemes have the property that they're vulnerable to denial of service attacks. Um, the, the enclave is not in control of, of the resources of the machine in the same way that, that a hypervisor is in control of resources. So if the operating system with a hypervisor that's running next to the enclave wants to deny, deny resources to the enclave, it can certainly do, do that. And then every, everything inside the enclave will, will grind to a halt. Okay, so the idea is Komodo, as, as with SGX, Komodo is responsible for doing the, the entering and leaving of enclaves. The OS is responsible for building up the enclave handing over secure or insecure pages to the Komodo monitor. And in general, doing all the resource allocation and, and scheduling and, and, and uh, in, input output. None of that is provided by the, by the mini hypervisor that Komodo yeah. consists of. So it would be really nice if you didn't have to rely on hardware for anything, but of course that's not feasible in order to, to build the monitor, you, know, you need some amount of hardware support. And they've worked to make that as small as possible. So in particular, there has to be a secure memory region that the monitor and the enclaves can use. Uh, if you only wanna protect against software threats, then the only hardware facility you need for this is some way to protect some of the physical memory from the operating system and any IO devices that might wanna do reads or writes to it. If you're also worried about hardware threats, then you, you need the SGX flavor of memory encryption or Mer Merkle tree and Merkle tree capabilities to make sure that even if, if the, the adversary can uh, read or write the secure memory, it cannot do it, it cannot violate the security guarantees. Um, the Komodo prototype does not have access to any uh, hard, hardware memory protection memory encryption or, or, or integrity capabilities. So we won't be talking about that anymore, but you should just bear in mind that yeah. that is a class of threats that SGX actually protects against. Yeah. And if you wanted to extend Komodo to protect against them, yeah. then you, you would need hardware support for memory encryption. So secure memory is one thing you need the hardware for, which is pretty minimal if you're only interested in software threat. Threats you can, you can basically define some region of the physical memory that the OS and, and the IO devices won't be allowed to touch. Protected execution, you need protected execution for the monitor. In SGX, this isn't really an issue because the monitor is all in microcode. But you also need protected execution for the enclave 
which means you need secure control transfer in and out of the monitor and in and out of the enclaves. And you need any uh, runtime state that the monitor and the enclave rely on to be appropriately isolated. That means the, the memory that the, that the enclave relies on and, the, uh, the, and its registers. You need a hardware root of trust for attestation, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later. And you need some source of randomness because without randomness, you can't do crypto. Yeah. What about attestation? So in SGX, the, all, all the attestation machinery is more or less hidden inside of the, of the micro, microcode. In Komodo, it's, it, uh, it's necessary to have some amount of hardware support for attestation, but it's pretty minimal. And here, here's their basic strategy. They have, there are two operations that you can do to, that support attestation. And these are, these are operations that, that an enclave can do to authenticate itself to the rest of the world. And that some, some, someone outside can do in order to verify that it's actually talking to a particular enclave with a particular measurement. So these two operations, the first one is called a test. Yeah. So the, 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 a caller enclave calls a test to set up a data structure that it can subsequently use to authenticate itself. And the way to think about it is the, the result of, of a test is a, it's a so-called message authentication code, which is that you can roughly speak, think of as being a hash of all of the code and data of the enclave, plus this additional eight bytes of data that's the parameter of the attest call. And the way you're supposed to think about this is that that data is an identification of this enclave. So in the language that I was using 15 minutes ago, the way you should think about this is the enclave is saying that that, that data is going to speak for itself. Well, itself is kind of vague. Concretely, the data is gonna speak for any enclave that it has the same measurement as this one. And remember the measurement is the hash of all the bits you know, that, that, that constitutes the enclave right now. Usually the data is gonna be some kind of signing key. So what the caller is saying here is that that signing key is gonna speak for the, the hash of all, uh, of all the contents of the enclave, the measurement of the enclave, which is MSE in this formula. So what that means is that if subsequently you, 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 you get the, some message X that's signed by KE, then you should believe that the enclave with that measurement is actually saying X. So how are you gonna to get to that point? The answer is you're gonna get there by calling uh, the other uh, API for attestation, which is called verify. So to verify you pass uh, a data, some measurements and one of these max that came, came out of a test and it comes back and it says, yes, that, that was, those were the data and the measure that were used to construct that Mac or no, they weren't. And if the answer is, is yes, then that's the monitor saying that the measure is saying that that data speaks for the measure. So let's, in order to understand how this actually works, let's yeah. um, see what it would take to convince some external third party that it's actually talking to an enclave with that measure. So first of all, we're starting from scratch here. First thing that happens is the hardware, the, the monitor gets a root of trust key from the hardware. This is the built-in mechanism that gets things started. The hardware has its own key, KH, and it makes a, a signed cryptographic statement that says, KH says, i.e. signed by KH, the key KM speaks for the monitor's measure. 
Then the monitor makes KM says that KE speaks for the enclave's measure, or it might delegate this task to some trusted enclave that doesn't verify in order to get this going. And then a third party has to trust KH for the statement that KH makes. Well, what statement is KH making? Answer, KH is saying, KH is saying that KM speaks for, M, for M's measure. Why should the third party trust KH for this? After all, KH is just some more or less, as far as the third party knows initially, KH is just some more or less random key. Well, remember KH is the, is the hardware key. So who is it that might know that KH is actually the hardware key for a, a good piece of hardware that you, could, that you should trust? The obvious answer to that question is, well, the hardware's manufacturer knows that. So in order to, for the third party to um, trust KH, which is what we're seeing down here, in order for the third party to trust KH, let me simply simplify a somewhat complex story a fair amount by saying, in order for the third party to trust KH, it has to consult the manufacturer and say, hey, um, some piece of hardware that claims to be, be from you, Intel, is telling me that KH is its key. Is that really true? And it, in, Intel has a fairly baroque privacy prever, preserving mechanism for being able to answer that question. So you get, the, you get the information from the manufacturer that KH really is the key for a piece of um, hardware that is yeah, supposedly, supposedly should be trusted for this kind of thing. And given that, then KH is yeah. gonna be willing to trust that hardware, we hope, um, for identifying the monitor. And then when, when, it, when, when uh, the third party sees what the, the, what the monitor says, i.e. this, when the third party sees what the monitor says, it, it knows that it's the, it's the a monitor with this measurement that is saying that the, that the enclave is speaking for the enclave. And it needs to trust the, that monitor for, for take, to take what's, it needs to, to believe, it needs to believe that that monitor is capable of, is, it should be trusted when it makes a statement of that kind. So notice now here, there's, there's uh, two elements of trust. The third party has to first trust uh, Intel when, when it tells, when Intel says that the, the, uh, the KH really, really is the key of a good piece of hardware. And then it has to trust that hardware identified by this particular monitor. And then it needs to trust the monitor for identifying this particular enclave. And that is precisely the trust sequence that, you, that you're depending on when you're doing attestation. In SGX, things are a little bit simpler because there is no monitor. Yeah. Monitor, there's just the hardware uh, attesting to the enclave directly. And the, the point of this story was that it's not necessary to, uh, the hardware app apparatus to, to, to measure and, and um, write these, these uh, certificates for the enclave is fairly complex. And it's not necessary to have that work being done by the hardware. Given the, the, uh, the basic root of trust mechanism, it's quite sufficient to have monitor software doing the rest of the work. And you can push this farther. You can have um, the thing that's being, the, the thing that's in the enclave that, that is um, being authenticated by this three-step operation that I've written down here could itself be an operating system, which, which is the, the, then the, takes a fourth step to, to authenticate some application that's running on top of it. 
Okay, so that's the basic story about the Komodo idea, push as much stuff as possible into software and use recursive attestation yeah. in order to, to um, provide that essential capability. So now let's talk a little bit about the Komodo implementation. Uh, the prototype that they actually built runs on a, yeah, yeah, yeah. An, an ARM feature called Trust Zone. And the idea of Trust Zone is that a Trust Zone processor is capable of running in one of two worlds, a normal world where you run the regular OS and applications, or a so-called secure world that has its own set of register, registers, its own uh, uh, access to memory and so forth. And all the registers are banked appropriately, so yeah. this can work. And, and they're building on top of that basic hardware capability. In order to believe in the, in the Komodo implementation, you need to trust the hardware and the tool chain of the verification. But you don't have to trust the monitor software because yeah. it's actually formally verified. So what does it actually mean to formally verify the the, the, the software for a monitor like this. Roughly speaking, the spec for the monitor says client enclaves are isolated from other software. So what that means is the only the enclave itself can modify its own code or data. And no bits of the enclave are gonna leak outside unless the enclave itself explicitly reveals them. So that's the spec. And then you're gonna show that the code implements the spec. So that's the, that's the verification, the high level of verification strategy. The way in which the, you're going to show that the, that the spec does what it informally says here is you're going to show what's called non interference. Non interference in this context has two aspects confidentiality and integrity. Confident, confidentiality means that all the public outputs of the system are determined by public inputs. Any out outputs that are generated internally to the enclave are not gonna be public. And integrity says that all trusted outputs are determined by trusted inputs. So what does that mean? That means that when the enclave, which is pr producing trusted outputs says something, produces some output, um, that output is not gonna depend yeah is not gonna depend on anything that was going on outside the enclave. It's only gonna depend on things that were trusted because they're inside the enclave. So the verification is verification of the monitor. It's not, there's no attempt to, to verify the enclave and we'll, we'll see yeah. Yeah. that notion that, that, that there's no way to verify the enclave yeah. is, um, realized in an extremely in an extremely aggressive way, as we'll see. And then the, the other aspect of it is the so-called local att attestation, which I was showing you on the previous slide. The monitor tells you the Mac uh, of all the code and data of, of an enclave. We did trust some. So how does this work? Well, the monitor has essentially one piece of abstract state, which is called the page DB. And what the page DB does is it maps a page number for secure memory into a triple, tells you which enclave owns the page, tells you what kind of page it is, and, yeah. and it tells you what the contents of the page is. This is, yeah. this is a, yeah, an abstract data structure, mind you. And there are six flavors of pages. A page can be a spare that means you got it from the operating system, but you haven't used it for anything yet. It can be a data page for, for the only enclave. It can be a page table for the only enclave, or it can be one of two things that really are puns. There's the, the one page that represent, represents the uh, identity of the enclave itself, which the paper calls the address space. And then for every thread of the enclave, there's a page. And 
you might think that it would be might be nicer to have separate data types for these address space and thread things because they're not really conceptually pages in the, the same sense that the data and page table pages are. But it's convenient to um, to package them all up into this one data structure. And, and the notion is the operating system can populate a page table by assigning pages to the enclave. The enclave takes it in one of these pages and labels it as a spare. And, and then internally, the enclave can decide to do something else with the page. So pages can, uh, of memory can be passed back and forth between the enclave, between the monitor or a particular enclave and the operating system. And this is a concrete exa example of a pattern that, that Komodo follows. And for that matter, that S S SGX follows also um, it, in several other places. We said that enclaves are, enclave mechanisms are not supposed to do any resource allocation. That means the operating system is doing all the resource allocation and essentially like handing over allocated resources to the enclave mechanism. And the, uh, the only job of the enclave mechanism is to make sure that it, this, the operating system is doing that in a, in a secure way. And as I said before, in the abstraction, you don't model or prove anything about the behavior of a particular enclave. Uh, in concrete applications, you may very well want to know things about the particular behavior of an enclave. For example, is it which of its outputs are affected by which of its inputs? And is it being appropriately cautious about taking in data from the outside world before starting to compute on it? But those are things that are going to be done entirely independently of the Komodo isolation mechanism. So what's the trusted computing base for all of this before we get into a few more details about how it actually works? Um, well, there's a model of some fragment of the ARM processor, uh, which you have to trust. There's a spec for the monitor, which consists of 12 monitor calls that the outside operating system can make on the monitor, basically to hand over resources or, or get or claim them back. And then there are seven so-called SVC calls that an enclave can make to the monitor. And as is generally the case with specs, you have to tr trust that the spec is correct. There are some consistency variants, as is also typically the case with specs, that you can, um, that, that the um, verification yeah. can, can verify or maintain, maintained no matter what state transition the whole state machine takes. But, but fundamentally you have to, the spec is something you have to look at and, and acquire confidence in. Uh, you can't prove that it's correct because what would you judge it against? Other aspects of the trusted computing base are the tool chain, the verification tools, Daphne and Z3, and the assembler, the linker, and the bootloader. So that's the trusted computing base for a system of this kind. Nothing too surprising here. So how does verification proceed in this world? Um, the monitor code uses the ARM machine model as the state machine. So the ARM machine model says if the PC is such and such and, and there's a particular ARM instruction there, then, then it's gonna take a step, a step and various aspects of the state are gonna change. Maybe it's some memory location will change or some registers will change or whatever. That's the machine model. Yeah, and that, that's what, what the um, verification uses to drive the state machine yeah. whose who's, um, performance it's trying to verify. The state, of course, is everything that's visible to the code. And basically, that's just the memory and the registers. Yeah. And they, they make a small hack, which is that they don't actually model the PC directly. That is, they don't model jumps or um, branch and link instructions or things like that. Instead, instead they have the PC level pseudo instruction that do if and while and procedure call. And then they, in an unverified way, they, they um, map those down into, they map those down into actual PC changing instructions. And this is 
the just, justification for this hack is that it makes the, the verifier's life quite a bit easier. Of course, this isn't going to work for transfers between the monitor and the inside of the enclave or between the monitor and the operating system because those can't be modeled as ifs and whiles and so forth because you don't have enough control. So those have to be treated specially as we'll see in a minute. The strategy that they use for dealing with exceptions is for the most part, they try to avoid exceptions for, for the code in the monitor by putting enough preconditions that have to be checked by the verification on, onto the execution of each instruction to guarantee that there won't be any exceptions. Of course, that isn't gonna work for interrupts because interrupts are totally asynchronous. So those have to be treated specially too, as we'll see in a minute. What the spec says for the code of an enclave is pretty drastic. Every time you, you transfer into the you know, enclave itself, um, the spec says that the enclave trashes all the accessible state, all the memory that, all the writable memory that it has, and all of its own registers, and then raises an exception. So this is the way they're abstracting the intuitive idea that they're not um, specifying anything about the way it, the code inside a particular enclave should behave. Okay, so that tells us how things work for <coughs> executing sequentially along from one, one instruction to the next inside a monitor. The grand strategy for verification is one that we've seen before in the context of Ironfleet, for example. Namely, that every time you move between um, the monitor and an enclave or between the monitor and the outside world. Uh, that's a so-called world transition. And it, everything in between two world transitions is gonna be treated as a single atomic action in exactly the same way that in Iron Fleet, everything between uh, uh, a whole bunch of receives and a whole bunch of uh, corresponding sends that follow is treated as a single atomic action. So the transitions are between any two of the enclave, the monitor, and the normal mode. And the transitions, of course, don't need to be deterministic because in general, um, the certainly the behavior of the enclave code and of the normal code is not guaranteed to be deterministic. Uh, so uh, um, modeling non-determinism yeah. in a, a, a a Z3-based verifier like, like Daphne is not particularly, it, it's possible, but it's, but, it, but it's not, it doesn't work out very well. So they turn, they, they do something which is similar to what we saw in, in Ironfleet under the name of, um, what did they call it? Something, I can't remember, making something concrete. Um, in, in this context, they say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna embark on this um, non-deterministic thing, but we're gonna make it deterministic by providing an oracle in the form of an unknown integer seed that, that decides every non-determinist, every, every place where there's a non-deterministic spec, the oracle is gonna tell us step, the oracle is gonna tell us exactly what that step is gonna do, thus making it deterministic. So all the non-determinism is pushed into this into this seed, and it, it's an interesting question that I don't I don't fully understand the answer to uh, whether there is anything wrong with this way of modeling non-determinism. It, it seems okay to me, but it, it it also seems possible to me that there are subtleties that I'm yeah. that I don't understand. Oops. So here's the overall flow of the verification. Um, the gray boxes are the trusted parts. You have to trust the specs, which are written in Daphne. There are manual proofs in Daphne. There are instruction definitions, which are written in this pseudo assembly language called Veil. Um, those, that's the ARM model. And then there's the annotated code of the monitor, which is also written in Veil. And the veil stuff goes through a thing called the veil tool, which produces two things. One of them is a proof written in Daphne. Uh, and the other one is a gener generated abstract syntax tree, which is also written in Daphne. Which the, the, 
the purpose of the abstract syntax trees is to be fed into a thing they call the assembly printer, which actually prints out assembly code to be assembled and, and loaded in, in to provide the, the code, the binary code for the Komodo monitor. The specs, the manual proofs, the generated proofs from Zale, and the generated AST go, all go into the Daphne verifier, which, whose job it is to verify that the generated AST actually implements the specs in, uh, in traditional style. So as long as you, as long as you trust the ver verifier, then you have this proof. And as long as you trust the assembly, assembly printer, which is a fairly straightforward um, thing, the job of which for the most part is just to provide um, symbolic opcodes for, for all of the yeah. machine instructions that are in the generated AST, uh, then you should believe that you've actually verified that the, that the Komodo binary uh, implements the trusted specs. So that's the verification story. Now, here, here's the rest of the, of the execution of the state machine story. As long as you're just running along inside the monitor, you, you have the, the ordinary sequential, step-by-step -step sequential execution that's taken care of automatically, well, more or less automatically by Vale and Daphne. But there are some transitions of the state machine that yeah. don't correspond to, to sequential execution of one instruction after another. And here they are in this picture. So there's transitions between the normal world. Now I'm really annoyed that I don't have any way to write. Wait a minute. Hey, it's come back. That's nice. There's transitions between the normal world and the, and the monitor world. The, the normal world can call the monitor world and the monitor world can return. Um, and there are those 12 uh, um, operations, so-called SMC operations that the normal world can, can do. Then the, the monitor can enter the enclave. The enclave can run and it can produce either a uh, call back to the via can produce an exception that calls back to the monitor, or there can be an interrupt. And if there's an interrupt, you go through an interrupt handler, and then you continue execution in the, in the monitor. And it's also possible in the, for the interrupt handler to return directly to, to an exception handler, and or for there to be an interrupt out of an exception into, the, into an interrupt handler, which would then, then presumably is gonna do a resume. And an exception hey. handler can hand, hands control after it's done its exception handling thing, hands control back to the monitor. So these are all the transitions of the state machine that don't correspond to straightforward step-by-step -step execution of the machine instruction. Okay, so in a little more detail, what's the top level spec that, that is, um, being verified. The top of the spec is a next predicate that describes the SMC handler. So it says, if you start out in state S with the, yeah. with, um, the page DB abstraction yeah. in, in, at D and you end up in state S prime, it tells you whether starting out in state S with the page DB in, in value being D, you might end up in state S prime with the page DB value being D prime. And its job, as should be very familiar to all of us after the, the, the bunch of examples that we've been looking at, its job is to relate the concrete machine and the abstract page DB states just after taking an, an exception from the OS to the final states just prior to returning. So this is the way that you verify that the monitor is doing the right thing about all of the 12 ways in which the OS can call it. There's only two of these that actually involve running the enclave code. The rest of them are pure function, are specified as pure function. You, you take in a particular page DB and parameters and you give back a, a new page DB uh, and, a, and a code that says whether it succeeded or not. 
So the two that involve enclave execution are entering the monitor and resuming. So how do they work? They, similarly, they relate two states and two page DPs, just the way the calls do. But the spec forces the code to enter the enclave from a state that's very severely constrained. The page table base has to be the right one. The page table in memory has to match the abstract one in the page D, in page DP. The TLB has to be consistent. That roughly speaking means that, that you haven't uh, um, taken away any pages out of a page table since you zapped the TLB. And the secure pages and the registers all have the correct content according, according to what page DP says. So the, the yeah. proof has to, the proof has to demonstrate that all these things are true in order for the spec to be satisfied. And the monitor code is free to do whatever it likes as long as it satisfies this, these requirements. So that's the basic, uh, that's the basic story. A little more detail about how the non-interference non argument gets made. Remember, there's two aspects to it. There's secrecy and integrity. Secrecy says that publicly observable outputs only depend on observable inputs, not on anything that's supposed to be kept secret. Integrity says the trusted outputs depend only on trusted inputs, not on anything that might, might, not, be, that might not belong to the enclave. So the basic style for doing this is to define an, a, a relation that they call observably equivalent. Um, and the, the notion is that if the initial states of two executions are gonna be related, then so are the final states. So if things start out observably equivalent, they end up observ observably equivalent. And as we, as we said before, uh, there is non-determinism of enclave execution, which is modeled by an oracle, which is one, one of these unknown indices, which is the same idea of step objects in Armada, or they have another name for them in Iron Cube that I can't remember. This non-interference story is a little bit oversimplified because it's not quite true that no information comes out of an enclave to the, to the outside world. So here are the things that, that do come out. If the enclave gener generates an exception, the outside world can find out what, what, the, what kind of exception it was. An enclave can do an exit back to the normal world and the exit can carry a return, a return value. And the de details of exactly which physical pages are being changed for, from spare to something else or being returned to spare are also visible uh, to the outside world. And there's a set of axioms in the spec that allow the, these violations of non-interference. And those of course are also like everything else in the spec, those are also parts of the TCB. Okay, so that's the grand story for, for Komodo. And let's just step back a little bit and compare it with SGX. But what, basically what they've done is they've replaced all of the microcode in SGX with uh, vanilla machine instructions, which they're calling the monitor. And what they've, the resulting artifact is better than SGX in two ways. One of them is that it's much easier to change the, the software of the monitor than it is to change the, the microcode of SGX. And the other is that there's actually a formal, you know, formally verified correctness proof that the monitor is satisfying the spec that they've written. Whereas, whereas there's no such proof, uh, at least as far as we know, there's no such proof for the microcode of SGX. So what can be learned from the whole experience? I've left out a lot of stuff about evaluations and how well it performs and, and stuff like that. Um, the first lesson that they cite is that you really need verification. Even a small, simple code base has bugs and they give some concrete yeah. examples. Typic, yeah. I think all the concrete examples yeah. have the same property that, that, uh, that you typically find in these situations. Um, Namely, yeah. namely, they have to do with corner cases. What happens if page A is, yeah. if, if a, an operation has two, two page parameters, A and B, and they turn out to be equal, maybe weird things could happen. Maybe the spec has to say that, that that's not allowed. It's the kind of thing that's very easy to overlook. 
the kind of thing that often one doesn't worry about that much when when you're just writing a garden variety, it, even where it's important for it, to, for it to be reliable or robust. But of course, in the context of security, you do have to worry about all these things because the bad guy is going to try them all. Uh, the second thing they point out is something that uh, is one of uh, the um, tropes of, of thinking about security. There are the, the, there's the so-called trusted computing base, which is all the, the things you depend on to be right. Well, trusted is not really a very good name for it. It would not be a very good PR, yeah. but it would be much better to talk about it as the untrustworthy code because it's the code that isn't verified and certainly it can have bugs. And we saw a bunch of examples of that, uh, none from Komodo, but from a variety of other verified systems. We saw a bunch of other examples of that last Thursday. There's certainly a lot of room for improvement in the tools. Um, all of the several systems that we, we've read about that use Daphne and Z3 have a canonical problem, which is that when the verification, the automated verification fails, it's hard to debug because basically the only information you get is that that uh, Z3 timed out. And the other, yeah, as far as I can tell, really the only debugging tool you have at your disposal, Z3 will doubtless spew, spew out all kinds, of, all kinds of trace information, but it's pretty inscrutable. So basically the only debugging tool you ever get is with disposal is what I think of as a clumsy version of print where you go in there and you, you, you add more assertions or more something to the code and see if that, yeah. that makes things sufficiently small that the verifier can either give you a counterexample or succeed. And the final example along these lines of uh, what do you what do you do if the if the tool is timing out? Um, the answer is yeah. you give it a smaller search space. And the basic way that you give it a smaller search space is by concealing some of the mechanism from the tool by making some of the functions opaque instead of instead of, of concrete. And then yeah. then you can prove lemmas maybe about how the opaque functions work, essentially axiomatize them rather than a, allowing the Z3 visibility into the state, yeah. into everything that's going on inside one of these functions. And in that way, you're going to uh, reduce the search space of uh, the prover and give it the guides that it needs in order to in order to actually terminate. Okay, that's pretty much the whole story for Komodo. As I said, the basic idea is really quite simple. Um, try to figure out how little hardware support you need for uh, bu building one of these enclave structures and uh, how you can make it so that uh, all of the soft all of the software that you need at least all the, all the software that actually gets executed uh, when the system is running so that all that software can act uh, actually have a formal spec uh, spec and a, and a formal correctness proof um, I think it's good to think of this in the context of this whole series of, of Z3 based uh, systems that we've read about. They all have different aspects, but they all have a lot of things in common, whether it's Ironfleet or, or Armada or um, this Komodo work. And there are several other papers that you can find in the literature, literature if you want to pursue these matters further. Um, to my knowledge, none of these systems has actually been deployed in anger, but I think they give fairly convincing evidence that if you have an application where correctness is really important and you're willing to pay a factor of maybe three or four in development time and cost, uh, you can get formal verification of the system. And that's true across a fairly wide range of of applications. The most recent work along these lines was just presented at OSDI, and it, it's a, a, a souped up ver version of the key value store from Ironfleet, where the actual implementation is quite a bit more complex. And they're able to, 
um, deliver key value of historic performance there. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's fairly impressive. It's not as good as the best unverified code, but it's, but it, but it's, um, it, it's reasonably competitive with a lot of things that are, are that are out there that are actually in service. So I, I, I'd, let, I'd be happy to entertain questions. We've got a few minutes. Nobody? Okay, then I guess we're done. Uh, on Thursday, we're gonna have uh, she. I think I'll, I'll talk about uh, sort of costs and, and confidentiality and two safety properties. Okay, yeah. which is yeah. another yeah. much more elaborate angle on, on um, non-interference than what you heard today. <laughs>